thanks to the scientific committee for the invitation. It is really a pleasure for me being here in, this, uh, in, a, in a workshop and in a location of such high cultural value. And first of all, I would like to disclose that I'm a dentist, not the evil and scary one that drills into your teeth, but the one that silently judges your teeth and is more interested in forces. Uh, I'm an orthodontist and uh, the word orthodontics means basically correct teeth and indeed it is a branch of dentistry dedicated to the correction of dental and skeletal malocclusions. Uh, it is quite an old science. Attempts to move teeth uh, were done through the centuries but we can state uh, and set the birth of this discipline uh, at the end of the 19th century when first the concept of appliances used forces to the teeth were um, systematically defined in, a, uh, in, this, uh, in this manuscript. And we are talking about oral deformities because sometimes teeth can be misplaced in a position that is different from the one that we consider ideal. And also the jaws can grow in a non-harmonic way compared to the other uh, bones of the skeleton. Um, and orthodontics is able to correct the position of the teeth and also, to a certain extent, uh, to modify the direction of the growth of the jaws uh, in a more harmonic direction. Those are some of the examples uh, of the appliances that we can use. All of these are having in common uh, the fact that they are um, designed to apply some kind of forces to the teeth. In fact, uh, orthodontic treatment is based on the principle that if we apply a force for a sufficient amount of time to a tooth or a group of teeth, we will observe uh, the teeth moving uh, following a process of bone remodeling. We owe a lot to Professor Charles Barstone because uh, he was the first defining the uh, biomechanical principles of orthodontics. And thanks to his work and the work of many other colleagues, uh, we know that teeth, when moved, abide to the basic principle of physics. That is not uh, a trivial assumption. Um, and since um, we can see only part of the tooth that we call the crown, but the majority of the volume of the tooth is embedded inside the bone and is called the root, um, it is usually difficult to have a translational movement, but uh, in most of the cases, we have some kind of rotation around a point that we call uh, the center of rotation okay, that can be closer or farther from the, the point of force application. Uh, but we know that if we plan some kind of movement, for example, we want to uh, rotate this canine, we can design a force system that is able to produce this kind of movement and we will observe this movement happening over time. Moreover, if we keep uh, the complexity of the system at the, the lowest level possible, having only three points of contact between the appliance and the tooth, we can also try to measure the force that we are using and that the teeth are experiencing. For example, if we want to apply this molar, we can model a um, cantilever that is inserted in a tube, so we have two points of contact between the wire and the tube here, and apply a force of 100 gram with only uh, a single point contact here. So we can estimate that there will be uh, another force with same modulus but opposite direction on the molar, and also a couple that is rotating the, the molar. If we decide, for example, that we don't want this vertical component of the force, we can model another cantilever that is applying an opposite force. 
in order to um, have at the end only a movement of rotation. And we are able to predict with a fair amount of precision, or at least um, a precision that is sufficient for our clinical needs, the movement that we will observe in the mouth. When, um, when the complexity increases because we have more than three points of contacts, then we can still be able to predict uh, the kind of movement that we will observe, but it is no longer possible to uh, have an, um, a, a true estimate of the forces that are experienced by <coughs> the teeth. Uh, well, from histological studies, we know that uh, the process of remodeling starts from six to eight hours after the first uh, application of the force, and then it goes. Uh, it, it is never um, a really continuous process, but usually it goes through phases, like uh, a lag phase when the movement slows down and another one where the movement, the speed of the movement increases and it goes up like this. Um, so we know pretty well the how and the what, but we're still missing uh, some aspects about why this process is happening. Uh, if we imagine to move this, teeth, this tooth in that direction and we know that if we apply this kind of force we will observe after a couple of months this uh, tooth in another, still in the alveolar bone but in a different position, we can imagine that we will, we will have bone resorption on this side and new bone formation on the other side. And in fact, uh, the first theory about tooth movement was defined by Schwartz at the beginning of the 20th century and it's called the pressure tension theory. Basically, Schwartz uh, described what he was seeing because if we apply a force to a tooth, the first thing uh, that in the tooth is displaced inside its uh, uh, alveolar socket. And so we have areas of compression and area of tension and unloading of the bone and this will uh, result in an osteoclastic activity on this side, an osteoblastic activity on the opposite side of the movement and at the end bone resorption and tooth movement. Later on Boundary proposed the bone bending theory saying that when the tooth is displaced in this way the bone is bended in, uh, in some way, and this bending is the trigger that initiates bone remodeling. The problem is that uh, this kind of description of tooth movement seems to contradict everything that we know about bone biology, because, and uh, Mersenne and Catania describe this very well, uh, you will have the chance to listen to Professor Catania uh, tomorrow morning. Um, if we look at the mechanical theory by Frost, we know that when the bone is loaded, it responds with bone apposition and bone gain. And when the bone is unloaded, we have bone resorption. So if we look at this diagram, um, according to the mechanical theory, we should have osteoblastic, osteoblastic activity here when the, where the bone is loaded, and not the contrary. Moreover, uh, orthodontic forces are typically very light forces because uh, we don't want to create a damage to the blood flow of the surrounding structures um, because otherwise we will have a completely different uh, biological response um, to, the, to the application of the force and therefore uh, orthodontic forces are usually in a range between 5 and 100 microstrains that are far below the strain level that is necessary to trigger bone remodeling. Although, we should remark that uh, those, this threshold is based on in vitro studies 
And we know that the threshold necessary to trigger monitoring in vitro is different from the one that is measured in vivo. So it could be that there are some differences here. Another point is that orthodontic forces are typically constant and quasi-static forces. But we know that from landmark studies by Lennon and Rubin and many other others that dynamic strains are the one that triggers bone remodeling. So either we accept that the alveolar bone is totally different from all the other bones in the body, or probably we are missing some point in this process. Probably uh, the answer to this problem relies in the particular anatomy of the uh, connection between the tooth and the surrounding bone. Here we have the alveolar bone. Uh, this is the tooth with the crown, uh, the root with cementum. And here we have a lot of collagen 1 fibrils uh, that we call the periodontal ligament. This kind of connection is a real joint, a very particular kind of joint that we call gonfosis, from the Greek word gonfos that means peg. Um, and it is a very particular joint because it, is, it has a large blood supply and a rich innervation with a large number of ruffinio receptors that are basically mechanoreceptors. Uh, the periodontal ligament has a variable width between 100 and 400 microns, and the width is not even uh, on the, the whole surface of, or the surface of the root, but it's wider on top and at the bottom and thinner in the medium part. And these double goblet shapes um, allow for uh, the two to easily tilt and move inside the socket under the, the orthodontic load, uh, under the masticatory load. And this kind of connection is the most advanced result in, uh, in evolution uh, because this kind of attachment is uh, unique for crocodiles and mammals. Other vertebrates have the teeth uh, either attached on top of the, the jawbone or on the lingual surface of the bone, but without any kind of soft tissue interposition. And of course, having this ligament between the tooth and uh, the bone provides a lot of uh, advantages to, to those animals. The first thing is that since we have a rich innervation, we can have a fine control of jaw movements. Indeed, the mechanoreceptors in the ligament act um, as the, the tactile sensitivity uh, of fingers in the control of um, object manipulation. Why is this? Uh, this is because you have like a pressure sensor inside the tooth that reacts to the consistency of the food. And you have many reflexes with the uh, jaw muscles that controls the movement of the, of the jaw. Uh, chewing is, is something really, really complex because there are many phases, many kind of uh, movements inside, during the, the cycle of, uh, of chewing. It, it and plays no role in the pulmonary model, but in the use of the teeth, no? Yes, also because we know that if we extract the, the teeth, uh, the alveolar bone is resorbed. So uh, it is uh, highly connected to the, the function of chewing. And this is not trivial also because we, are, we have lost this, this habit, but our ancestor and other animals used the teeth to kill and hold prey. So having a fine control of the jaw movement is uh, something uh, that gives you an advantage. No? And also it allows to chew on very hard food. Mm, moreover, the presence of the ligament acts as a damper because when we have masticatory loads on the tooth, uh, we observe a complex uh, combination of translation and rotational movement that overall reduces the stress that are felt by the ligament. And there is another advantage. Uh, Sorry, the tooth is deformed during mastication. 
the tooth itself, I don't think so, uh, because it's quite rigid. But honestly, I never found uh, articles. One should measure these things. Uh, that would be interesting, yes. Yes, because also the study, for example, was uh, focused on the, um, on the ligament and uh, the movement of the tooth uh, as a whole. So we don't know if the, the tooth can bend. As far as I have in mind, also the fibers are different in, 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 in the, where they are located. In the, in the yes, they also have different orientation. Uh, yes, uh, and they are even carrying names. Names, uh, yes, yes, yes. Depending on the on the two attachments. Play a different damping role. Yes, 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 yes. That's true. Yes. And uh, we also have a lot of liquids inside the ligament. Exactly. That was what we were uh, talking this morning. And since the, the alveolar socket is not, uh, contains a lot of foramina and we have a rich collateral circulation, these fluids can go in and out from the periodontal ligament. And so they can act like an hydraulic damper. Uh, indeed, uh, this could explain why the periodontal, the periodontal ligament has been described as a nonlinear and viscoelastic material. In fact, if we, if we observe a tooth under masticatory load, we see first a rapid phase of movement where the fluid is squeezed out from... But then the membranes for the, the ligaments also have to have a special structure too. The mem sorry, the membrane? The ligament is, has a membrane around, because otherwise the fluid would be out. Uh, no, the, the fluid is um, linked to the pro protoglycans inside the extracellular matrix and part of the fluid is the blood because the, the ligament is um, as a blood supply you have, cap you have vessels inside so the vessels are squeezed and the, the water that is bind to the extracellular matrix is also uh, squeezed out And then you have a slow phase where the, the ligament fibers are stretched. And then if we unload the tooth, uh, we have again another rapid phase where the, um, the fluid is recalled from the surrounding structures and the volume is replenished. And then a second slow phase where the, um, the fibers are again in a slack configuration. And so some authors suggested to consider this uh, structure as a squeeze film due to its um, uh, anatomical characteristics. And so we can infer that it's the presence of the periodontal ligament that explains the discrepancy between what we observe in the mouth and what we know about uh, bone biology. And if we think again at the example that I, was, uh, that I made before of the tooth displacement, we can now imagine that if we apply a force in this direction, the fibers of the periodontal ligament on this side are slack, and so we have bone unloading on this side that could explain why we observe bone resorption here, while on the other side the fibers are stretched, so the bone is loaded, and we have bone opposition on this side. Uh, of course, um, it is probably uh, important to consider the concept of tensegrity. So it could be that it's the uh, tensional balance between the cells, the cytoskeleton, and the extracellular matrix uh, that is altered under the, the orthodontic load that could trigger bone remodeling. And we know that uh, osteocytes have um, formed a very fine and intricate network uh, inside the bone, and they act as mm, mechanosensors. And some authors observed micro damages to the bone 
Uh, even in trabeculae that are quite distant from the point of force application, and for force lever that are lower uh, compared to the ones that are needed to uh, alter the shape of the periodontal ligament. And we observe this kind of micro damage both on the tension side and on the compression side. So it could be that uh, it is also this micro damage that starts the process of bone remodeling. But as a final remark, we should underline that if we measure at the macroscopic level the strains produced by orthodontic force, uh, we see that those strains are low. But if we uh, measure them at the microscopic level, the strains are way higher because the surface of the bone around the alveolar socket is not even, but we have a complex morphology with spikes and depression and foramina. And so there can be uh, small areas where the, the, um, the loading is very high. And also, uh, we like to think at pressure and tension as uh, concepts that are um, very well defined and dis distinct. But in reality, we can observe areas of loading and unloading, even in adjacent zones in the, in the periodontal ligament and bone interface. So why do we need predictive models? We say that uh, we are able to um, know where the direction of the movement will be. But the problem is that when we increase the complexity of the system, we know the movement that will happen, but we are not able to uh, be aware of the force that we are applying to the teeth. We can only try to guess, but we are, we are unsure whether the force level is the physiologic one or not. And if we apply too much force, we can have side effects that are unwanted and we can also slow down the process of uh, tooth movement. And the current state of the art on this topic is not satisfactory because there are um, a lot of articles where the properties of the PDL are not well described and they are described in a very dishomogeneous way and we can have <coughs> difference in results even in the in six order of magnitude of differences. And this is why the mechanical properties of the periodontal ligament are not well uh, understood and it is really difficult to characterize its hyperelastic, viscoelastic and anisotropic behavior. Uh, the importance of the presence of the periodontal ligament was confirmed also by the study where the authors um, try, uh, uh, mm, perform two models, one considering the, the periodontal ligament as a solid and the other one considering it uh, as a fibrous structure. Although the authors of this, uh, this paper model the ligament as an homogeneous isotropic and linear elastic material, that it's not exactly the truth. So what we thought is that uh, a predictive model that could uh, define orthodontic tooth movement should consider the periodontal ligament as a nonlinear viscoelastic and hyperelastic material. Uh, for example, the Maxwell model um, could be adequate to describe the time-dependent behavior of the periodontal ligament. Uh, this kind of models, and we have seen some examples, was also used for human arteries that in a way they can be assimilated to the, the ligament, although there are some differences. And it is also possible to model the, the periodontal ligament fibers um, in order to describe the anisotropic behavior of the, the tooth under, or under orthodontic load. Uh, some authors also suggested to model the ligament as a squeeze film. And also, um, if we want to measure the strains, uh, it is important to model the ligament bone interface uh, in an anatomically accurate way. Otherwise, we can end up with uh, inaccurate measurements. In conclusion, 
developing a reliable method uh, to predict orthodontic to movement will be very helpful to better understand the process of orthodontic to movement as, as I showed to you is not fully understood yet. Uh, it could be helpful to estimate the force level and thus preventing side effects and also it will reduce the biological cost in developing new appliances because if we have an accurate model we can need lesser clinical trials for example and so I will conclude with a uh, let, let's call it take-home message uh, that the periodontal ligament plays a fundamental role in the mechanical description of orthodontic tool movement and that its properties needs to be fully understood and include in any model that um, tries to depict uh, this phenomenon. Thanks for your attention.